History is often relegated to a list of names and places and dates. However, the reality is that history is about real people with many of the same struggles faced today. The stories of the past connect us with those who came before. Bartholomew County historian Susanna Jones knew that and wanted to convey to everyone that history can be fun and engaging. In 1985, she wrote an excellent book that covered the first 60 years since our county's founding. Obviously, then as now, there is so much history to document, it would be impossible to capture everything. Still, every story has a beginning, and as Susanna's title states, in our case, it began with Bartholomew. General Joseph Bartholomew was born in 1766. In 1798, Bartholomew brought his family to the newly created Indiana Territory. He gained fame as a military officer, and this is where he met General John Tipton. Both fought at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 against a powerful Native American alliance formed by the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. However, it was his brother Tenskwatawa that led the forces into battle against his brother's wishes. The Native forces suffered a devastating loss that would have repercussions for decades. Bartholomew and Tipton served in the Indiana State Legislature together and were two of the ten commissioners chosen to select the site of the new state capital, which would become the city of Indianapolis. Though they were of different political parties, Tipton introduced the 1821 legislation to name the newly formed Bartholomew County after his commander and friend. The generals were no different from any other white inhabitants at that time and believed they were more civilized than the Native Americans. Tipton and Bartholomew spent their military careers fighting indigenous peoples and negotiating often lopsided treaties that allowed white settlers to claim these lands. While some of these actions by our ancestors are cruel by today's standards, we must put them into the context of their times. Should men like Bartholomew and Tipton be held up as heroes? Should they be viewed as villains on the wrong side of history? Or perhaps both? Current and future generations will decide those important questions. Bartholomew County was founded in 1821, just five years after Indiana statehood in 1816. This early Indiana map shows the state of Indiana around the time Bartholomew County was added. Although Bartholomew County was actually founded first, it has not yet been labeled, while Shelby and Marion County appear on the map. At its founding, Bartholomew County's size was significantly larger than it is today, as in this Indiana map circa 1830 because most of the current day Brown County was originally part of Bartholomew County. When Brown County was formed 15 years later in 1836, Bartholomew County became the size that it is today. All of Indiana's 92 counties are divided into smaller sections called townships. In Bartholomew County, the townships were not determined in 1821 when the county was founded, but were slowly organized over the next 20 years. By the beginning of 1822, only Sand Creek and Wayne Townships in the south of the county had been formally organized. In May of 1824, five more townships were created. These included Clifty, Nineveh, and Columbus Townships, along with two townships north of Columbus, Driftwood and Flat Rock. Driftwood Township included the area between the Driftwood and the Flat Rock Rivers, and Flat Rock Township included land east of the river to the county line. Later that same year, Driftwood Township's name was changed to German Township. Additional changes occurred over the following 20 years, and by 1847, Bartholomew County was organized into 14 townships, which would remain in place for almost 100 years. The area of the county north and northwest of Columbus, including Nineveh, Union, German, and Flat Rock Townships, primarily an agricultural region with a unique history. German Township was originally bordered by the Driftwood River on the west and the Flat Rock River on the east. The Driftwood River flows from the northwest corner of the county towards its meeting with the Flat Rock River in Columbus. Two busy mills were found on the Driftwood River in the 19th century, Tannehill Mill west of Taylorsville and Lowell Mill about three and a half miles south. The first mill at the Tannehill site was built in 1822. Zachariah Tannehill bought the land along with the early flour mill and a distillery around 1830. He later converted the distillery into a woolen mill shown in this photo. 
The flour mill at Tannehill was purchased by David Miller in 1876, and this 1879 map of the area shows this area, including the dam upriver, the bridge, and the flour and grist mill, which used a water wheel to turn a stone and grind grain into flour. The current of the river at this location was reportedly strong enough that the mills could r run year-round and flatboats left directly from this area to carry goods downstream to the Ohio River and beyond. Also present on the map was a mill race, which was a man-made narrow channel of water dug from a spot upriver to the downriver area to create faster water flow to power a mill. Mill Race Park in Columbus is today named for the mill race that was used in the 19th century to power the mills and factories in early Columbus. In 1900, the Tannehill Mill Race was gone, and the mill was owned by S.S. Drybread. The mill, located just north of the bridge on the east bank of the river, is the flour mill, which is seen in this undated photo taken around the turn of the 20th century. The sign of the building advertises Silver Moon Flour for sale by S.S. Drybread, manufactured in Taylorsville, Indiana. The Tannehill Covered Bridge was built around 1870 and was one of the last two covered bridges in Bartholomew County when it was torn down in 1965 and replaced by a modern bridge. Today, little remains of the Tannehill Mill area but the name of a road and a local neighborhood. While some early mills had towns spring up around them, the closest town to the Tannehill Mill was Taylorsville, which is located on US 31 north of Columbus in the center of German Township. Taylorsville is the only town in German Township and was founded in 1849. It was first known as Herod, but the name was changed to Taylorsville in honor of President Zachary Taylor in 1852. Although the town has remained small, it has had a post office since 1849. Having a post office was a mark of significance for small towns, and around 1850, there were 13 towns with post offices in Bartholomew County. Today, there are only six county post offices remaining, including Taylorsville. Since the beginning of the county, the Taylorsville area has been important in transportation of people and goods, first due to its location near the Driftwood River. Later, it was the home of a stagecoach inn and a stop on the railroad between Columbus and Indianapolis. The mid-19th century stagecoach inn building still stands today on Tannehill Road in Taylorsville, and it is used as apartments. When the JM&I Railroad was completed between Columbus and Indianapolis in the 1840s, the tracks went right through the Taylorsville area. Railroads then were often known by the initials of the cities they passed through, and the JM&I was named for Jeffersonville, Madison, and Indianapolis. This 1879 map shows Taylorsville with the railroad tracks bisecting the town running north and south. This circa 1910 photo postcard looking east shows the tracks crossing Tannehill Road with the depot on the left. An 1856 train schedule shows the northbound route from Madison to Indianapolis on the left and the southbound stops on the right. Between Columbus and Taylorsville, there was a stop at Lowell, which was also sometimes known as Hornbrook. The Lowell station was called a flag station, meaning the trains only stop if a flag or other signal was displayed or if passengers wanted to get off or on the train. West of the Lowell Flag Station on the Driftwood River was Lowell Mills, a bustling small town in the mid-19th century. The earliest mill was built at Lowell around 1821 when Bartholomew County was founded. By 1824, the first permanent road to connect the Ohio River to Indianapolis, called the Mox Ferry Road, passed through this area. Between 1830 and 1880, Lowell Mills included two grist mills, a woolen mill, a shoemaker's shop, a distillery, and a sawmill. There was also a cooperage where wooden barrels, casks, and buckets were made. This 1879 map shows both the Lowell Mills area at the left and the Lowell Flag Station along the railroad on the right. Like the Tannehill Mill, Lowell Mills had a man-made mill race to power the mills. After all of the mills and factories closed around 1880, Lowell Mills was abandoned and most traces of that town disappeared. Like Tannehill, there was an old covered bridge at Lowell that stood until the mid-20th century and was one of the last covered bridges in the county. It was torn down in 1959 and replaced with a new concrete bridge. Today, all that remains of the once thriving area are a historic marker, the road sign for Lowell Road, and piles of stones remaining from the old bridge abutments. 
Both Bartholomew County's waterways and its location on early railroads and roads meant that transportation was important in the development of the county. But other factors, including agriculture and religion, were also crucial to how and where the county developed. Religion in particular was important to many of the early settlers in Bartholomew County, and the northern areas of the county were homes to several very early church communities. In 1821, just as the county was founded, the Methodist Episcopal Church organized its first Methodist circuit, which was called the Flat Rock Circuit, and which served all of Bartholomew and Jennings County, along with parts of Shelby, Morgan, and Jackson counties. Circuits were areas of land covered by traveling preachers. Because of the number of people and the distance between them, early Methodist preachers were called circuit riders and traveled on horseback from place to place, preaching in homes sometimes to only three or four congregates at a time. That same year, a Methodist Episcopal church was formed in the Hall Patch, which was the area between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. This was the first Methodist church in the county and one of the earliest of any denomination. By 1822, a log church was built called Liberty Meeting at the north edge of what today is Columbus Municipal Airport. The church building was gone before 1879, but Liberty Cemetery survives and includes the graves of many early settlers. Also in 1821, another Methodist congregation was formed at Lowell Station called Carter's Chapel. The church was close to the eventual location of the railroad tracks. Again, as was common, when a church building sometimes disappeared, the cemetery associated with the church often remained. Today, part of the original Carter Cemetery is hidden in plain sight between the north and southbound lanes of US 31, just north of Columbus. Although some of Bartholomew County's earliest churches did not survive, others have thrived for over 200 years now. Around the same time the Methodists were organizing their church communities, at the time of the county's founding, Old Union Church in German Township was founded. Frederick Steinbarger was a member of the denomination known as New Light Christians. Setting aside one room in his log cabin for worship, the Old Union Congregation was formally organized in 1821. A framed church building was erected in 1853, and in 1884 a brick structure was constructed which still stands. The church is located at the intersection of County Roads 50 West and 800 North, and Steinbarger is buried in the cemetery across the road. Closer to Columbus, another early German township church has also survived. The New Hope Christian Church was organized in the 1820s by a group of Baptist worshipers, including a man named Benjamin Irwin, uncle of prominent Columbus citizen Joseph Irwin. Around 1855, a group of congregants broke off from the New Hope Church to form a Christian church in downtown Columbus called the Tabernacle Church. The Tabernacle Church later became First Christian Church. However, even as some church members left, the New Hope congregation itself continued to grow, and a brick church building was constructed in 1871. Although the building has had many additions and renovations, it is still recognizable where it stands on Highway 31, adjacent to the railroad shacks just north of the Columbus Township line and near the former Lowell Flag Station. One prominent Bartholomew County family associated with New Hope Christian Church was the Perry Breeding family. Ransom Perry was born in North Carolina in 1774. He served seven months in the War of 1812 and fought under General Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Perry arrived in Bartholomew County around 1822 with his wife and eight children, just one year after the county was founded. In 1835, Ransom Perry hired Colonel James Glanton, a furniture and cabinet maker, to build a home on North Washington Street. At the time, the house was well outside of the city limits. Today, this is believed to be the oldest home still standing within Columbus Township. Colonel Glanton had three daughters. One of them, seated left in the photo, married Joseph Irwin, the prominent Columbus citizen involved in banking and industry who built the Irwin home on 5th Street. Another of Glanton's daughters, standing in the center, married Ransom Perry's son, James M. Perry. James M. Perry eventually became the largest landowner in Bartholomew County, owning around 6,000 acres of farmland at the time of his death in 1909. Among his land holdings, Perry owned the land surrounding the New Hope Christian Church and the cemetery behind the church where he is buried. In 1890, he built a home on land next to the church for his son and family. James M. Perry's granddaughter, Blanche, was born and raised in the home, which still stands today. In 1916, Blanche married Henry Breeding, 
whose family also had longtime Barthelemy County ties, and they moved together onto the breeding farm in northern German Township. Henry Breeding's grandfather, Elza Breeding, first purchased 160 acres of farmland in 1847 for $240 in German Township near the Shelby County line. A brick home was built on the property in 1860. After this house burned, another home was rebuilt in the same style in 1871. The breeding family slowly added to their land and by 1879 owned over 600 acres in northern Bartholomew County. Henry bought the farm from his uncle prior to his wedding to Blanche in 1916. The breeding farm was an active farm. Henry raised and sold beef cattle and Blanche raised chickens and had an extensive garden. The large barn on the property was built after World War II to replace an earlier wooden structure that had burned. Henry and Blanche lived together in the farmhouse until Blanche died in 1977. Henry then remained on the farm alone another several years until his own death in 1982. The Brittings had no children and willed the farmhouse, outbuildings, and 161 acres to the Bartholomew County Historical Society, which continues to maintain the farm as part of its collection and as an event space for weddings and other gatherings. Just east of the New Hope Church is the historic New Hope, or Tinky Bridge, an iron and concrete two-span frat through truss design extending 256 feet across the Flat Rock River, one mile northwest of Columbus. The bridge is located on County Road 400 North, which connects U.S. 31 and River Road. Built in 1913, the New Hope Bridge was a significant contribution to the development of the city and to agriculture in German Township by connecting U.S. 31 to the rural areas across the river. Evidence suggests that the large steel trusses were fabricated by the Caldwell and Drake Iron Works, a construction and contracting firm located in Columbus at the turn of the 20th century, which manufactured steel truss bridges all over southern Indiana. Caldwell and Drake is most famous for the construction of the West Baden Spring Hotel in southern Indiana from 1901 to 1902. The firm was also known around the country for building over 20 buildings at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and at least 13 domed courthouses in Indiana and five other states. This bridge is the last Caldwell and Drake Bridge remaining in Bartholomew County. After almost 80 years of wear and tear from traffic and from weather, the New Hope Bridge was closed in 1990 due to concerns for its safety and structural integrity. It remained closed for several years until the decision was made to restore and repair the bridge rather than replace it. Due to the cost of repair, the decision was somewhat controversial at the time. While many argued that the bridge had significant historical value, others believed a one-lane bridge on a narrow country road should instead be replaced with a larger structure that could carry more traffic. The project went forward, however, and the bridge reopened to traffic in 1998. Today, the historic one-lane bridge is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. County roads and bridges were critical to farmers and the development of the agricultural industry. Around the turn of the century, the Reeves family would introduce technology and equipment that would contribute to the further growth of this important segment of the Bartholomew County economy. Ultimately, they would found two companies, Reeves & Company and the Reeves Pulley Company, they would both create innovations throughout the United States. Reeves & Company was an agricultural implement company that produced equipment that was used by farmers all over the country. Reeves' inventions included a tongueless corn plow, a straw stacker, threshing machinery, steam engines, and more. Reeves' plows were famous for their strength and were used to plow virgin prairie in the western United States around the turn of the 20th century. Reeves' steam engines were used to pull large farm equipment. While Reeves & Company produced equipment used in farming, the Reeves Pulley Company made an impact on industry, producing wood split pulleys, which were used in many early factories. Wood pulleys were lighter and stronger than cast iron pulleys, which were heavy and prone to shattering. Reeves pulleys ranged in size from a few inches to 22 feet in diameter. At the time, most factories used steam engines to supply power, with the engines turning overhead shafts attached to pulleys and belts connecting the pulleys to necessary factory machinery. Reeves Pulley Company also invested in other new technology at the turn of the 20th century and produced a clutch, variable speed transmissions, gas engines, and early automobiles. The variable speed transmissions were used in sawmills 
and also in Reeves Automobiles. In 1896, Reeves produced what is generally considered to be the fifth American automobile known as a motorcycle. Today, many Reeves items are part of the Bartholomew County Historical Society collection and used for educational events at the Henry Breeding Farm and elsewhere. Although agriculture has been important for much of Bartholomew County since its founding, it was the rich land of Flat Rock Township between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek that attracted the first white settlers. This area was known as the Hall Patch, as much of it was covered with small haw trees. Travel was difficult because the land was swampy and covered with underbrush. Still, the farmland was fertile and attractive to early settlements by those who came in the county's first years. Although some of Bartholomew County's earliest towns have survived for 150 to 200 years, others like Lowell Mills disappeared from the map. Flat Rock Township also has several so-called ghost towns, including one located on a busy county road. The intersection of River Road and County Road 550 North is at the edge of the Hall Patch and is called Owens Bend for a bend in the Flat Rock River and the name of a family who once lived nearby. Today there's a park there, but once a town called Cormantown was located on this spot. At one time, because of the river, the area was busy with a sawmill, a grain mill, and a woolen factory. A man-made dam provided power for the mills, and several shops supported families who lived nearby. Today, most of the signs of the town are gone, except for a cemetery and a few homes. The cemetery was once part of the Flat Rock Baptist Church, which was one of the earliest church communities in the county, founded in 1821. The church building was torn down around 1920 and a stone marker erected the following year to commemorate its location. On the edge of the former Corman town stands a brick building that used to be a schoolhouse. Built in 1885, this building was used until 1913 to educate the children of the families who lived in Corman town and the surrounding countryside. In the 19th century, Indiana state government required every township to be responsible for free public education. Since no money was budgeted to the townships, schools generally operated on subscription, meaning families were required to pay for their students' schooling, and sometimes families paid with goods or services instead of cash. In 1879, Flat Rock Township had 10 district schools, meaning some students had to walk several miles to get to a school. This school was known as School No. 8, but it was also called Quick School because the land for the school was donated by Judge Tunis Quick, who owned the land and lived just up the road. This was a one-room school, meaning that children in grades 1 through 8 attended the school in the same classroom with one teacher. The teacher could earn $2 a day teaching 14 students in 8 grades with an extra 10 cents a day for cleaning the school. This 19th century map shows the school just down the road from Cormantown and Flat Rock Baptist Church near Tunis Quick's home. The church has been gone for over 100 years and the businesses for over 150 years. Today all that remains is the cemetery and a few houses in the old Quick School, which like many other former schools in Bartholomew County, has been repurposed as a home. The disappearance of small villages and towns on rivers was not uncommon as transportation routes changed over time. Once trains arrived in Indiana, water transportation became much less important and towns that were not near the tracks often struggled to survive. The train first came to Columbus in 1844, but as it expanded toward Indianapolis, the track did not connect to Cormantown. Instead, the first railroad passed to the west at Taylorsville. A few years later, another railroad came through the area, but bypassed Cormantown to the east. This time, many of the people and businesses in Cormantown followed the railroad to a new town called Clifford. Some of the buildings themselves were even moved. This map from 1879 shows the railroad going through Clifford and Cormantown is no longer present near the Flat Rock Baptist Church. Clifford was founded in 1853 along the Cambridge City branch of the Jefferson, Madison and Indianapolis Railroad. While the main branch of the line passed through Taylorsville, the Cambridge City branch ran east of the main line. This 1879 map of Flat Rock Township shows this branch coming from Columbus in the south through Clifford and then north through the small town of St. Louis Crossing before entering Shelby County on its way to Cambridge City in eastern Indiana. A more detailed map shows the town of Clifford with the railroad track cutting a diagonal line through town. 
The railroad tracks are now gone, but some evidence remains that the railroad once went through the area, including the Depot Street sign, the grassy alleyway along Miller Street showing where the tracks once ran, and the angle of the telephone poles that lead south toward Columbus. Telephone and utility poles often ran along railroad tracks for several reasons. First, railroad tracks always took the most direct route between stops. Second, utility companies required easements or the right to build on property belonging to someone else to install their poles and lines. It was much easier for the phone and utility companies to obtain an easement from the owner of a railroad or a road rather than from the numerous landowners along a different route. Today, the routes of telephone or utility poles often indicate abandoned railroad lines. Because of the railroad, Clifford had a depot or railroad station to let passengers on or off and to load or unload cargo. The Clifford Depot still stands behind a tall fence, but it has been repurposed as a residence. Although it's partially hidden, the angle of the home and the large roof overhang are typical of the architecture of depots in the mid-1800s. Other evidence of the railroad that once ran through Clifford are largely gone. The rails from the track have been removed and the ties have all rotted away, even a bump in the road wearing away. Other small parts of Clifford's history are remarkable as well. Even though Clifford was a rather small town, at one point it had its own school, several stores, two churches, and a post office. In 1901, a school was built on the south side of Main Street. This school burned in 1913, and a larger brick school was built on the edge of town to replace it. Clifford High School was the smallest of three high schools in the county in the middle 20th century. Columbus High School, Hope High School, and Clifford High School. When Flat Rock and Hall Creek Townships consolidated their schools in 1957, the Clifford High School students merged with Hope High School to form Hauser. After that, the Clifford School Building served as an elementary school for 16 years before it was torn down in 1973. Today, the site is also known as Alumni Park in honor of those who graduated from Clifford High School. Founded because of the railroad, Clifford has survived long after the railroads left by holding on to pieces of the past. Although the town population is under 300, it is one of only six towns in Bartholomew County with its own post office, a post office which has been present since 1853. The area around Clifford is rich farmland in the Hall Patch, with the Flat Rock River located to the west and Hall Creek to the east. Today, these farms fields yield corn, soybeans, wheat, and sometimes other crops. Because the land was originally very swampy, drainage pipes have been laid underground. Agricultural drainage involves laying rows of pipes made of clay, concrete, or perforated plastic under the soil to remove excess moisture and direct that moisture into drainage ditches or creeks and eventually into rivers. Past Hall Creek Bridge on 450 North, there is another district school turned into a house. This was once known as the Steinbarger School, named for the family who owned the land at the turn of the 20th century. Some of the children who attended this school lived just down the road in this once thriving town of Nortonburg. This map from 1900 shows Nortonburg on the railroad line and the Steinbarger School down the road. Nortonburg was on the Columbus, Hope, and Greensburg line that connected Columbus to Cincinnati. In 1886, six trains passed through the town each day four freight trains, and two passenger trains. There was also a depot, a general store, a blacksmith, and a sawmill. Nortonburg was named after the Norton family who lived in the area. William Norton founded Nortonburg and operated a huckster wagon, which was a wagon full of various goods driven from farm to farm to allow families to purchase what they needed without going to town. He stocked his wagon from the trains passing through the town and covered a 7 to 10 mile radius from the depot. William's son Ephraim became postmaster of the post office and Ephraim's wife Matilda ran the general store. Growing up in Nortonburg, Ephraim and Matilda's sons attended the Steinberger School down the road. One of these sons was Overton Norton, who grew up at the turn of the 20th century in the house just west of the sign and who lived to be 92 years old. This is a photo of Overton Norton as a young boy in front of the general store. Small town general stores had almost everything someone might need. Coffee, sugar, flour, hardware, plus fabrics, and even some items like cups and coffee pots. This general store also had the only phone in town 
at a time when phones were brand new and too expensive for individual homes. To make or receive a phone call, the people of Nortonburg used the phone on the wall in the general store. And when a call came in, it was Overton's job to run to that person's house to tell them to come to take the call. Once the railroad stopped running through Nortonburg, the town gradually faded away. Nortonburg's post office closed in 1912. Today, not much is left of the town but a few houses and an old railroad sign that marks where the railroad tracks once ran. Across Bartholomew County, Indiana, and the United States, many people made the transition from living in small rural communities to living in more urban settings throughout the 20th century. And yet, some small towns have survived, some perhaps smaller than before, but holding on to their sense of community by retaining historic names or structures or creating a monument to a past person or place. Although areas of Flat Rock Township, including Cormantown, Clifford, and Ortenburg, look much different than they did in the past, the change took place slowly over time. On the other hand, one area of northern Bartholomew County changed very significantly, quickly, and intentionally due to global influences. In 1941, as World War II was raging around the world, the U.S. government was searching for an area in Indiana to construct a large military training camp. 40,000 acres were selected in northwest Bartholomew County, including all of Nineveh and Union Townships, along with small parts of Brown County and Johnson County. This map shows all of the landowners in Nineveh and Union Townships a few years prior to World War II. With one month's notice to relocate, 500 families living in the region were forced to sell their farms and homes, including 402 Bartholomew County families. 11 of 15 cemeteries in the area were relocated. The tiny town of Kansas, population 13, disappeared. Camp Atterbury opened in 1942 and changed the map of Bartholomew County forever. Camp Atterbury was named for William Wallace Atterbury, a Hoosier who became a Brigadier General in the United States Army during World War I. In addition to training over 275,000 American soldiers, Camp Atterbury housed a large prisoner of war compound and a huge military hospital. Between 12,000 and 15,000 Italian and German prisoners of war were housed here during the war, and Wakeman General Hospital treated over 85,000 casualties from 1944 to 1945. Many local residents worked as civilians at Camp Atterbury. The camp was deactivated in 1946 after World War II had ended, but then reactivated several times in the following two decades as the United States military became involved in other conflicts. From the 1970s to the 1990s, Camp Atterbury was an Army National Guard training site providing support to the Indiana National Guard. Today, Atterbury primarily provides military training and serves as a mobilization site for the United States military, and it provides an economic boost to Bartholomew County. Another area of Bartholomew County was permanently altered due to World War II and the development of Camp Atterbury. The U.S. military needed a landing field for Camp Atterbury, and in 1942, the government began surveying land on the northern edge of Columbus Township and into Flat Rock Township to build an airport. Fourteen farm families were forced to relocate, and Atterbury Airfield opened in 1943. The airfield served as a training facility for B-25 and B-26 bombers and for gliders. It was also used as a landing field for hospital planes bringing soldiers to Wakeman Hospital at Camp Atterbury. Located just 30 miles north of Freeman Field in Jackson County, where the famed Tuskegee Airmen were stationed, Atterbury Air Base also played a significant role in the training of the first black American bomb squadron. Over 130 buildings were located on the airfield property, and one of the original buildings, which still stands today, is the historic Air Base Chapel, restored and named in honor of Jean Llewellyn Norbeck. Norbeck was born and raised in Columbus and graduated from Columbus High School in 1929. She and her husband Edward were living in Hawaii when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941 and the United States entered World War II. Edward volunteered for the Army and Jean became one of the first women to serve as a military pilot when she joined the WASP, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots. Norbeck was one of only 1,074 women to successfully complete the training. In 1944, Norbeck was tragically killed in a training accident in South Carolina. 
1954, the name of the airfield was changed to Bacaller Air Force Base in honor of Lieutenant John Edmund Bacaller from Hammond, Indiana, who was shot down over France during World War II. The U.S. military closed Bacaller Air Base in 1970, but just two years later, in 1972, the airport was purchased by the city of Columbus for $1, and the name was changed to the Columbus Municipal Airport. Today, Columbus Municipal Airport is the fourth busiest airport in Indiana and a significant transportation resource that boosts the local economy and helps Columbus attract businesses and jobs. In 2019, the airport had over 50,000 operations, including 3,600 military operations in cooperation with nearby Camp Atterbury. The airport is crucial for local businesses transporting goods and personnel and provides a $650 million financial impact on the city of Columbus. Today, much of the northern area of Bartholomew County remains an agricultural region, but Camp Atterbury and the Columbus Municipal Airport have their own important history. The Atterbury Bacaller Air Museum, located at the airport, shares the history of Camp Atterbury, Bacaller, and those men and women who trained and worked here during World War II, during Korean and Vietnam Wars, and today. For over a century, the Bartholomew County Public Library and the Bartholomew County Historical Society have worked to discover, collect, preserve, and share the stories of the people who made Bartholomew County what it is today. We are indebted to the previous work of individuals who believed, as we do, that the knowledge of our collective history is critical to understanding our present and as a valuable tool for informing the future. People like George Pence, Vida Newsom, Ross Crump, Susanna Jones, Harry McCauley, and Tammy Stone Iorio all made it their life's work to think about the generations who came after and to make sure our history was not lost. No matter if your family has been here since the county's founding in 1821, or if you recently located here, Bartholomew County's story is your story. Be inspired by those that came before you and determine from their struggles and their triumphs, what can be your story and how can you make an impact? History is happening every day. Don't let it pass you by. We're very grateful and excited to be a part of this lifelong journey with you.